Today we're going to begin a uh, study on the subject of uh, continue revelation, but we're going to start at the beginning and uh, work through it. And we're going to talk about um, the book of Revelation from a chronological point of view. And uh, the book is, uh, and we're not going to go through it verse by verse, we're going to go through an overview. And um, it's, it's interesting as you look at the, most of us are interested in the book of Revelation. And um, the church regularly receives submissions from people who say that uh, they found something brand new in the book of Revelation or something, uh, some secret code in the book of Revelation. And uh, that's been going on a long time. And uh, most of that, you know, as you begin to analyze it, is not accurate. Do we understand uh, the book of Revelation perfectly? We do not. And, um, but uh, we do have a good idea about uh, a number of things that God reveals in the book that we can be uh, uh, sure and certain of. And one thing that is certain is if we understand the book of Revelation chronologically, you know, there's an order in which the book is going to play out if we do understand the book of Revelation chronologically and which steps follow one another, then it will be harder for us to be led astray. And uh, as you, for those of us who uh, were in the Worldwide Church of God, you remember back to the book, uh, the, un, uh, the book of Revelation unveiled at last and it talked about the layout of the book and, and it mentioned inset chapters that are in there and uh, those are important things to understand because they're not chronological. They're in there and they give us information, but they are not chronological. We uh, also have chapters that go back and look at the uh, stream of events from different perspectives. Uh, they are not uh, one after the other. Uh, they are describing events taking place at the same time. So they're similar events, but they're taking place at the same, they're related, but they're taking place at the same time, but they're not the same event. And uh, as we go through this, I'm assuming that all of us have taken the time to read the church's literature on the book of Revelation. Um, <clears throat> we have some good, good information on the book of Revelation, and hopefully you've taken time to read it. And, uh, and, uh, I, and as we go through this, I'm assuming that you've taken the time to do that. And uh, as you, I mentioned inset chapters, and so how do you... Uh, keep track of all of that? Well, uh, one way to do that is uh, in these chapters, and, and to keep track of it all in the chronology is to, to, in your Bible, write as something comes to a stop, and you go on through maybe an inset chapter, you can say stop, and, uh, and this is where the story flow comes to a stop, and uh, then you can write in there skip to, and the verses that pick the story up again chronologically. And so you don't get bogged down in the uh, uh, inset chapters, which are not part of the chronology. And, um, and then when you get to that new chapter where things pick up, you can say the story resumes here. And that way you can kind of keep track in the book of Revelation itself uh, how things unfold. The key to the contents of the book of Revelation are given in... Uh, outline form in Revelation chapter 1 verse 19. So let's go to Revelation chapter 1 verse 19. <clears throat> and this verse gives us a, uh, an overview of the major points that John's going to cover. John chapter 1 verse 19. Speaking to John, Christ says, Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. So, John receives some instruction. He says, write the, the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. So, John is to write down what he sees. So, God, in vision, helps, John, helps him to see what we find in the book of Revelation. So what you see, write down. 
And he says, then he says the things which are, so that tells us that there are things that are going, that beginning in the time of John were taking place. So not everything begins at the end of the age. There are things that have been going on that are brought out in the book of Revelation that have been going out the whole way. So not everything is that case, is that way, but there are things that have been going on, like he says, things which are. For instance, it addresses seven churches. Those churches existed in John's time. John was the apostle, and John had regular interaction with those seven churches. So they existed in John's time, and um, they, they, they existed at that time, and we know uh, that they are dual, that uh, not only did they apply to that particular time, but they apply down through history and the characteristics of the particular churches you could find at different times in the history of the church. And it is interesting, the characteristics that you find in a particular church era uh, tend to stand out at different, it's not the main thing, like Ephesus had certain qualities and characteristics, and they were characteristics of the church of the first century and sometime thereafter. But that church ceased to uh, exist as the, the apostolic church and it moved on to another era. Did it mean everybody from that era died out? No, but it, it continued on through the various eras. So they are, uh, the church is applied to John's time and they're also, uh, there's also a prophetic aspect. Um, so the third thing he writes down is the things which will take place after this. So he's telling them that there are certain things that I'm writing about that are going to take place after this, visions of things that are going to be in the future. So we understand that John is writing things that he sees. He is writing uh, things which are, which were going on in his time and may continue on into the future and things that will take place after. So this is a, gives us some idea of three things that are important for us to understand as we look at the book of uh, Revelation. <clears throat> now let's go to Revelation chapter one, verse one. Revelation chapter one, verse one. And it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. So it says the revelation. So does anybody uh, remember what the word for revelation is? Apocalypsis, apocalypsis is the way it looks like it's pronounced to me, apocalypsis. And uh, so what does apocalypsis mean? It means a, a revealing, like it's called the revelation, that means a revealing or an uncovering, uh, an unveiling or disclosure. And, um, you know, it's uh, of, of something. This is a book is a revealing of something that has been covered, that people didn't know. And you think about it in, this is written sometime around 90 to 100 AD. And there's, there are things in this book that nobody knew before. Before it was written, nobody knew some of these things, like the new heavens and new earth. There's a, there are allusions to it in other portions of the Bible. But there are things that are unique to this book that God reveals uh, to uh, John and uh, John reveals to us. So it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's something that Christ is revealing and uh, which God gave him to show his servants. So the book of Revelation is not a revealing to the whole world. It is a revealing to the servants of God. A revealing to the servants of God. 
And God is telling them things which shall shortly take place. So, <clears throat> so it's not a message to the whole world. It is a message to the servants of Jesus Christ. Things that will, it says, things which shall take place uh, shortly. And uh, what was taking place shortly? What was taking place at that time in the 90s AD? Well, you had the seven churches on the mail route. And what was going on at that time, the apostolic church, of which John was a part, was still going on. John <clears throat> was... Uh, the apostle to those churches and the apostle, uh, the last of the apostles that remained. Uh, he was part of that era. And in the 90s AD, the church was almost ready to transition to the Smyrna era, the next era that would follow. And uh, so as, uh, and as you look in the 300s, a couple of hundred years later, um, we find the uh, great religious system of Rome uh, had be, begun to be dominant. And uh, uh, in that time, the persecutions uh, on the church took place. Uh, you go back to Revelation 12, and it talks about the church being in the wilderness for 1260 days. And we've understood that to be 1260 years, which began around the year 325 when the Council of Nicaea met. And uh, they established certain rules and the way things were going to be, and the uh, church began to be persecuted in earnest. So we have things that are happening in a short period of time after this is given. They're already going on. It says, notice that, that he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. So it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, and uh, it's not a revelation uh, about Jesus Christ, it's a, a revelation about what Christ is going to do, about the establishment of the kingdom of God and all of the events that are going to occur as that comes about. So God the Father gave the message to Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ brought the message, uh, was passing it along uh, to his angel or servant to give to John. And John wrote it down so that we could have that book uh, reserved for us. So um, thankfully it has been preserved because it gives us insight into things that would be difficult for us to understand if uh, it had not been written down. And you know, as you look at the, the book of Revelation, I think it fascinates us as human beings. We want to know, well, what does that mean? What is that? And, and know all about it. But you know, if you have no background in the rest of the Bible, then the book of Revelation is not going to make much sense to you. Uh, because as somebody said, the book of Revelation is, a, um, is not elementary school. The book of Revelation is basically the graduate level. And for you to put it all together, you have to have some understanding of the past. Understand uh, the the Pentateuch, understand the writings, and all of the things that you find in the prophets, and then you can use them to help you to understand what's unfolding in the book of Revelation. So in this, in this book, there are several keys that I'd like you to think about. First of all, it mentions a door, we'll get to that here shortly, a door uh, to the temple that is mentioned. And each time the door is opened, or an angel as pictured as going in and out of the temple, it's going through that door. So there's a door that's opened so that John can see. Uh, the first mention of the door is Revelation chapter 4. And uh, there is a meaning for that. The message either comes from the temple, from the throne of God, or God sends a messenger, a messenger to John to help him to understand. And knowing that there's this door and there are things being revealed, it helps us to put the chronology of the book together. There are several other little items that are mentioned a number of times that help us to understand. For instance, for instance it talks about a time and times and half a time. It talks about 42 months. And it talks about 1,260 days. 
Now, what are those three things? Well, they're all equal. They all mean the same t- thing. They all mean the same thing. They're referring to the same t- time period. And there is only one 1260 day, three and a half year period of time. There aren't multiple times that uh, encompass that amount of time. So what is, what it, when it is mentioned several different times, it's mentioned from different perspective. For instance, the, um, let's go to Revelation chapter 11, just to look at it as an example here. Revelation 11, it talks about uh, the two witnesses, and it says they're to measure uh, the, the temple and the court and all of that. And it talks about the Gentiles will tread the holy city for 42 months. Okay, they're going to tread the holy uh, city for 42 months. And it also says, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. That's the same period of time. They're not different periods of time. It's just telling you for 42 months, the city of Jerusalem is going to be trampled underfoot, and the two witnesses are going to be working in Jerusalem at that time. So that it's the same period of time. And uh, as you see that, that number, you have to realize it's talking about the same period of time. It may mention other things going on, but you might take the time to go, well, what does this say and what does that say? And you can see, okay, it's all talking about the same time, but different things that are going on during that time. <clears throat> a, um, another key to understanding the book is to understand that as you go through it and you try to understand it, then it's kind of like a movie that, uh, we, that's, that's going on. And uh, in the movie, we see a scene in the present so there's a scene going on. Then we go back and, and we, we are referring to the same period of time, but it's something else going on. Okay, it's, it's the same movie, but it takes you back to help you to understand that something else is going on at the same time. So the book of Revelation is written somewhat like a movie that... Uh, is in the present, but it'll also go back and tell you other things that are going on in that same period of time. As I said, in Revelation 11, it talks about the two witnesses in the three and a half year period. And as you look at that, it doesn't fit chronologically, but it tells us uh, what's happening in Jerusalem during these, this three and a half year period. And there are uh, other examples as we'll see. So we need to understand that God is telling us from a number of different perspectives, there, there are a number of things that are happening, and uh, there are several chapters in the book that are panorama chapters. For instance, thinking of the, the, the seven churches mentioned, they begin in the time of John, and as you look at those churches, they are spread out over the panorama of the entire history of the church. So they, go, they span that whole panorama, and you have to realize that that whole panorama is part of that. <clears throat> and uh, the, that panorama comes to an end in Revelation chapter 20 with Christ's return. So with that background in mind, let's uh, take a look at chapter 1. And we'll, we looked at chapter, verse 1 already, so we'll begin in verse 2. Revelation chapter 1, verse 2. It uh, says, speaks of uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ, and uh, and to and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God, and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. So we're told about the written word of God that John knew of, and the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the message that he brought. Uh, basically a prophecy about what is going to happen. And uh, John's going to tell us all of the things that he saw. And he faithfully wrote them down for us. Verse 3 tells us the purpose of the book. It says, Blessed is he who reads, 
Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. So the purpose of the book is so that we can um, put it all together. It is, is so that we can read it and we can practice the admonitions that we find in there. Because it does tell us we're to keep the commandments of God. We're to walk in faith. It does tell us things that we will read and understand and, and we will heed them. Uh, the purpose of the book is not so that we can know who the beast is, who the false prophet is, or the exact timing of the return of Jesus Christ. That's not what this is all about. You see, God is interested in how we're living because if you, you know, as has been said before, you may know who the beast is. You may know who the false prophet is. You may know a lot of intricacies of the book of Revelation. But if you're not living by the things that it talks about in there, it doesn't matter. God's not going to say, you got an 80% on the quiz over what all those things represented in the book of uh, life, in the, in the book of Revelation. He's not going to say that. He's going to look at how we, how we live. We're to read and understand and hear and then keep those things that are written. And we're told uh, that we are to overcome, that we are to endure to the end, and that we are to keep the commandments. And all of these things are written in the book of Revelation, and we are to uh, put them into practice. As I said, let's go to, um, down to verse 4. <clears throat> so John was to share these things with his servants. And where are his servants found? They're found in the church. And John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is... He existed at the time, who was, he existed in the past, and who is to come. He's going to return to the earth. And from the seven spirits who are uh, before his throne. So um, the seven spirits uh, are before his throne. This is a message from Jesus Christ. And uh, we've always looked at these seven spirits as one spirit for each of the church eras. Each uh, angel assigned to one of the church era, God's spirit was in all of the churches, and uh, he was keeping his, he was going to be with the churches, keeping his promise that the gates of the grave would never prevail against them. Verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So he's telling us that, um, that Christ is a faithful witness. He was the firstborn from the dead. He lived in the flesh, he died, and he was raised from the flesh, and he's the firstborn. And he is going to be the ruler over the kings of the earth, and uh, to him who, had, who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He paid the price in order that we could be forgiven. He's a faithful witness, and we can rely on the words that he relays to us here. Let's go to verse. Um, let's go to verse seven. Verse seven says, "Behold, he is coming with the clouds." So there will come a day when we can look up into the clouds as the seventh trump sounds, and we're going to see Christ descending. He's going to be, be descending in the clouds, and every eye will see him. It's not going to be something that's hidden, something that people don't know about. So this, this scripture just undermines completely the rapture idea. He's going to come in the clouds and every eye will see him. It says, they who pierced him will see him. So how is it that, when did they pierce Jesus Christ? What year was that? 31 AD? So how is it that these men who pierced him are going to see him? They're dead. They're long gone. But he says they, they who pierced him will see him. It has, you know, the only way that's going to happen is, is if there is a second resurrection. 
So they will be raised up from the grave and uh, they will see him whom they pierced. And I'm sure that, you know, to me, they're going to rise up from the grave and they're going to see Christ and they're going to think, hey, uh, you know, uh, Julio, wasn't that the guy that we stabbed there years ago? Well, you know, I think it was. Ooh, maybe we need to keep a low profile here. But they're going to see him whom they pierced, and I'm sure they're going to be a little bit worried about what they did. But, it's not, you know, Christ is forgiving, and it's not going to be an issue. But they will see him, him whom they pierced. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. So as uh, Christ returns, uh, people are going to see him returning, and uh, they're going to be, uh, you know, not really understand it and be quite concerned. It says in verse 8, I am the Alpha, that is the beginning, and the Omega, the end, the beginning and the end, says he who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I am the Alpha and the Omega. And um, so it's, you know, Christ is very much involved in this and in revealing what this is all about. John uh, then talks about himself, beginning in verse 9. He says in verse 9, I, John, both your brother, so he was a brother to them in Christ, and companion in the tribulation, so he suffered. He suffered for being a Christian. He is their brother. He is a companion in tribulation, and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So John was uh, their brother in the faith. He was a member of the church, and he's uh, writing in the time of the seven churches. And he was a com their companion in tribulation. At the time that he was writing, the emperor was a man by the name of Diocletian. And Diocletian was persecuting the church. He inflicted the first great persecution on the church. And John suffered for being a Christian. He suffered for practicing the truth and preaching the truth. And he was on the island of Patmos uh, for the word of God because he believed it, he taught it, and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. He taught that Christ was going to return, that Christ was going to be the king of kings, and there was no emperor that ever lived that wanted to hear another king was going to take his place or his successor's place. They, most people that are in positions of rulership, they don't want to give it up. And uh, the Roman emperors most assuredly didn't want to give it up. So he was uh, testifying to the things that he had heard and that were promised. And he says in verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. So what does it mean he was in the spirit on the Lord's day? So was the, one interpretation of that is this was Sunday. This was Sunday. Now he was in the spirit on the Lord's day, but what, what's he talking about when he's speaking of the Lord's day? The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, the day when God intervenes in the affairs of mankind and begins to uh, put down all opposition and prepare the way for the, the coming of the kingdom of God, for Christ to return and set up the kingdom. So uh, it's uh, speaking of the time when God will intervene in world affairs and begin to dominate the earth. And uh, we have this loud voice that's mentioned here, and, uh, and as you look at other places in the book of Revelation, you will also see it mention a loud voice. And uh, so as you go through, if you happen to read through the book of Revelation, and you see a loud voice mentioned, you might look at, okay, it's a voice, and what is it saying, and in what context? That way you can kind of put that together because if there's a loud voice, it's there for a reason and relaying something that's important to uh, be aware of. And uh, the voices uh, uh, are, are found there and uh, many times they're angels. And as you study the book, as I said, it's good to just take a look at wh what is said. 
So behind him, he hears a voice like a trumpet. And then in verse uh, 11, it mentions the seven churches. It mentions the seven churches. And then in verse um, 12, it says and uh, talks about the seven lampstands, one lampstand for each of the churches. And Christ is walking in the midst of those lampstands. Symbolic of the fact that Jesus Christ was uh, very much a part of the church and watching over the church and uh, involved with it. And, uh, and that's always been uh, the case and always will be to the end of the age. Verse 16, he says, He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. So uh, <clears throat> verse 16, uh, you know, he uh, we remember we talked about the brightness of God as he, the new Jerusalem is established. And you can tell this is God by the brightness of his glory. He tells them not to be afraid. He's the first and the last. He said, he said I'm in verse 18, I'm alive. I was dead, and now I'm alive forevermore. He, he was alive in the fret, flesh. He was killed, uh, his side being pierced, and he died as a physical human being. He was raised up, and he lives forevermore. In verse 18, he also says that he has the key to the grave and death. He has the power to open the graves and bring people back out. And uh, so we see here that Christ is laying the groundwork for things. He says in verse 20, The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So there is an angel, a star associated with each church and seven lampstands, one for each church. Now we're not going to go through chapters two and three. We're, going to, we're looking at this as an overview and we're going to move on to try to get a grasp on the chronology of the book. So let's go to Revelation chapter four. In Revelation chapter four, we begin to see things that John sees as being present now. But he also sees things that are going to be continuing for a long time after this. Things now and things that will go on for a long time after this. Chapter 4, verse 1 is uh, the beginning of the real chronology of the events of the book of Revelation. So when you're thinking about chronological points, chapter 4 begins the chronology. And um, yet chapter 4 and even chapter 5 are simply uh, a, a setting. Uh, because essentially what's happening in chapters 4, or five, four and 5 is there is a court being convened. So you're seeing a courtroom drama play out in chapters 4 and 5. So it's a, the holding of court there. That is uh, what we see. We see God's throne there because God is the judge and we see the 24 elders there as well. And then they begin to talk about a seven sealed book which contains the judgments of the earth. And because peop the people of the earth are, uh, it's a sinful world, and they've been judged and found guilty, and a judgment is being made in this court. And uh, the judgments that are decided upon in this court are said to be uh, good and right, uh, because the people of the earth must be judged if they're to survive. God said, I'm going to have to intervene and stop the madness. And uh, God is judging them. And if he didn't judge them and intervene, there would be no flesh saved alive. So again, the chapters 4 and 5 are essentially a vision of court taking place in heaven. And this is a chronological event. And this begins at the time when the seals are opened and all the judgments of the earth begin to be carried out. So let's begin in chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1. It says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing op open in heaven. So 
Here it speaks of this door that I mentioned earlier. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after. So John, in vision, is taken to this door that is opened in heaven. And, uh, and the vo first voice which I heard was like a trumpet. Uh, remember earlier it talked about a voice like a trumpet, which turned out to be Jesus Christ. Here the voice says, come up here by this door in heaven, and I will show you things that will take place uh, uh, after this. So the beginning of the book of Revelation, chronologically speaking, is when John is taken in vision up to heaven, and he sees the court session taking place. So there's a court proceeding taking place here. It says... <clears throat> In verse 2, it says, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So he's in vision. As the door has been opened, he sees one sitting on the throne, and this court proceeding unfolding. And uh, so uh, as you look at this, you're, he's being able to see God's throne. So... As you look at this particular vision, there are several, a few other prophets that were able to see visions of God's throne. Ezekiel saw God's throne, Isaiah saw it, and so did uh, Jeremiah. And then John, here at the end of the church age, was uh, given the opportunity to have a vision of God's throne. Verse 3. It says, and he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. So, uh, you know, as you think about this, uh, you can imagine it. If you've seen a rainbow, you know what a rainbow is like and the different colors that are there. But this here happens to be like an emerald. I've not seen an emerald uh, colored rainbow, uh, but uh, it, it's hard to describe. Uh, God's throne in human terms. In verse 4, and that around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting. So who are these elders? I mean, we can only surmise angelic beings of some sort, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. So these 24 elders, we don't exactly know who they are, but they are uh, in all, uh, like they are angelic beings, spirit beings that uh, serve God at his throne. Verse 5, And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So uh, we talked about the seven spirits of God, one sent to each uh, church era. So we have these lamps of fire symbolizing God's spirit working with the different eras of his church. And perhaps uh, what we see here symbolizes that God's work with the seven churches is done. And it's time for the next step, you know, thinking chronologically. That that work is done and it's time to move on. In Revelation 4, 6, it says, Behold the, th the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. So th there are these four living creatures, and it, and it mentions of those creatures. The first cr living creature was like a lion. The second like a living creature like a calf. The third living creature had the face of a man. And the fourth living creature was like a, a flying eagle. Now, if you look at the cherubim, these are the four faces of the cherubim. And are they cherubim? It just mentions one of their faces. It doesn't talk about four different faces. Could be, we don't know exactly, but um, uh, they're similar to what Ezekiel saw in, back in his time. Verse 9. It says, Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever... It says, the 24 elders fell, fall down before him 
who sits on the throne, worship him who lives forever and ever, and cast their thrones before the throne, cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive the glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So we have the heavenly court seated, and we have the 24 elders announcing that God the Father is a righteous judge and is more than qualified to judge and to punish those on earth who are in rebellion against him. So they've made note of what's happening on the earth, and they're, they're going to make a judgment. And that brings us to chapter 5. <clears throat> It says, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. So this scroll is a judgment. It is the judgment that the court has come to. Now, I've not gone to court many times, or I haven't gone to court at all. But usually when you go to court and the proceedings are done, there is a judgment made, and the judge will sign the decree. Is that, that accurate? So the judge signs it and make, makes it official. And um, so, as I said, we have, have this court there, and, uh, and typically in a court, a judgment is made, the judge signs it, and then what they did back in John's time and before that is the court decided they would roll up the scroll and then they would seal it with the judge's official seal. Usually there would be hot wax dropped on it at the point where there was a, uh, the break. It would seal it so it would not open until it was time to be opened. So they're going to seal this, this, this decision, this court judgment with seven seals. They seal it with seven seals on the scroll of judgment against the earth. So what we're seeing in chapters 4 and 5 is this court proceeding, and a judgment has been made which is written down in this scroll, which is sealed with seven seals. And it says in verse 2, so the judgment's been made, so who's going to open this? Verse 2, then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? So who's worthy to open this scroll and carry out the judgments that are found in this scroll? Because the judgments in the scroll are to be carried out. Somebody has to begin the process of carrying out the judgments on mankind that have been decided upon for all of the evils that are going on on the earth. Verse 3 tells us that who's going to open it? And, they, and it said, No one in heaven or on earth or under earth was able to open the scroll or look at it. There wasn't anybody that could open the scroll on, on earth or in heaven. So, uh, so it says, John said that he wept because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or look at it. So John, again, is still in vision. And then in verse 5, it says, But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Be behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. So this is, you know, this is a reference to the Old Testament. And how would you know what this meant? if you didn't know something about the Old Testament, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. The root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. You know, one of Christ's titles is the branch, which is a, not the whole tree, but a branch, a descendant it's talking about. And it says that this, uh, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed. And the word prevailed means that he's gotten the victory. He has conquered. So he's now qualified to open the scroll. So the question is, how did Jesus Christ qualify to open this scroll? Was it just a matter of his birth? How did he qualify 
to open the scroll. Well, it was a matter of Jesus being completely obedient during his physical life. He was completely obedient, giving himself as the payment for our sins so that many more brethren could be brought into the family of God. Jesus Christ prevailed. And Jesus has qualified to open the book and to carry out the judgments that are found in the scroll. So uh, uh, Christ is able to open the scroll. Verse 6 of chapter 5. It says, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and with the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain. Now think about this. If you didn't know anything about the Old Testament, what is the lamb, what's the significance of the lamb? We've thrown out the Old Testament, except for the Psalms and Proverbs. The rest of it's in the waste can. So what in the world does the lamb have to do with anything? Because you have reference to the Old Testament, you know what he's talking about. We know who the lamb is. Isn't that right? We know that the lamb is the one who symbolically was sacrificed at Passover. And one of the titles that's used again and again in the book of Revelation is the Lamb. It's telling you who the Lamb is. Jesus Christ is the Lamb. And uh, he's a, a Lamb as though it had been slayed, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the hand of him who sat on the throne. Now, if you think about that, again, you know, when people try to tell you about the Trinity, it's pretty hard for one person to be standing there and then to go up and take this scroll out of the hand of another. Usually that tells me there are at least two beings involved here, which is, is uh, absolutely the case. So the Lamb of God was slain for the sins of mankind, and this verse also these verses also describe, uh, you know, the seven horns and the seven eyes and the seven spirits of God. Verse 8, now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, which each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And, you know, as you look at this and what's described here, People see this, well, this is what we're going to be doing in God's kingdom. We're going to be there at God's throne, and we're going to have harps, and we're going to be bowing down incessantly before God and playing on the harps, and uh, is that the case? That's not the case. You know, we will worship God and honor God and bow down to him and worship and honor him, sure, but that's not all we're going to be doing. And this verse is... Uh, very important for us to understand because it talks about golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And this verse is important to us because it, it reminds us of the prayers of God's people down through the ages that have been heard and that are kept on record. There's nobody that has not uttered a prayer to God that has not been heard. And you know what? Some of those prayers were never answered. You know, when I believe it was Polycrates was going to be burned at the stake, or was it Polycarp or Polycrates? Maybe Polycarp. One or the other was going to be executed. He's going to be burned at the stake. You don't think he cried out to God to please save him? And God said, not, it's not going to happen. I'm not going to save you. And he died being burned at the stake. And <clears throat> so he cried out to God and God did not answer his prayer. But do you think that God forgot it? God didn't care? No, God knows what he said. And God has made note of that. You look at the, at the uh, uh, Stephen in Acts chapter 8. Stephen uh, spoke to the crowd. The crowd became infuriated and they stoned him. You don't think that Stephen cried out to God? But God heard his prayer, and God did not intervene to stop it. 
And that's not been the case just for Stephen, but for others who have been faithful to the end. So all down through the years, God's people have been have given prayers of distress, some of which he answered, some of which he didn't. And God has heard those prayers, God has recorded those prayers, and uh, they are described as being in golden vials uh, full of incense. God hasn't forgotten them, and God will ultimately answer those prayers. Let's go to verse 9. Chapter 9, and it says, And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Christ is worthy to take the scroll because he is the one who was slain and he has redeemed mankind by his blood out of every tribe and nation and people. And have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Those people that have been redeemed, their the purpose is for God to give them rulership over the earth. Verse, verse 11, Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and number of them was 10,000 times 10,000. That's 100 million. That's 100 million and thousands of thousands. I don't know what what that means beyond that. But we know that there are a hundred million plus angels. My wife and I were listening to a sermon and we were talking about a third of the angels rebelled against God. And so I thought, well, a third of the of a hundred million is thirty is thirty three million. And she and I said, I, I, I think he's his mass messed up. And she said, No, I think I don't think so. So we went back and listened to it. And as you look at it, it says that there are a hundred million plus righteous angels. So if he took a third, that means 50 million angels rebelled against God. That's an amazing number. An amazing number. So I stood corrected. It was uh, not 33 million, but 50 million to be more, 50 million plus probably to be more accurate. And these angels were saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who has, was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Now Christ already had these things in heaven. But what God's talking about and working out here is what's going to take place on the earth. That God is going to, the time has come for Christ to receive riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing as he assumes rule over the earth. So it's a just judgment that God is going to send Christ back to the earth and to inherit all things and to become a part of what is going to unfold here during the millennial kingdom and beyond. <clears throat> Chapter 5, verse 13, it says, And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea... And all that are in them I heard saying, Blessing and honor and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And everybody is elated that this is going to happen. The judgment is something that's reinforced by the four creatures and the 24 elders. So that's the beginning of the chronology of the book of Revelation. And uh, this chapter... Uh, this, this two-chapter picture of the court being held in heaven at God's throne. And then we move on from there to the opening of the, the, the seals. We begin to open the seals. <clears throat> so we won't get through all the seals, but we will get through a, uh, at least a couple of them. It says, <clears throat> it says in chapter 6, verse 1, now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. So the seal is going to be opened, and I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Now, 
We've always understood this as false religion, deception, false teaching, teachings that have gotten man way off base. But why would you conclude that this is false teaching, that this is religious deception? It's a, this being on a white horse, behold a white horse, he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. Why would, you, why would we conclude that this is religious deception? What's that? Christ had a sword. But doesn't Christ come on a white horse? And with a crown? How many? Many crowns, okay. So he comes on a white horse. He's got many crowns, but he's got a sword. Because if you look at it, they're both on a white horse. And one has a bow, one has a, a sword. And there's a distinct difference between them. And um, so when you stop and think about the white horse of false religion, when did false religion begin? Did it begin in John's time when he was on the island of Patmos and they're being persecuted? When did it begin? Did it begin in the Garden of Eden? Or not in the Garden of Eden, but once they sinned and, sinned and got kicked out, what, did they, what was the issue? How were they deceived? Didn't he say, you shall not surely die? Isn't that a fundamental premise of most of the world's religion? You shall not surely die because you have an immortal soul. You're in, you have an immortal soul. And um, it's been the, the, you know, false religion be, began back in the time of Adam and Eve. And the thing is, it's been part of the world all down through time. So is this, you know, is what's described here, is this, this, what's the big deal? This has always gone on. So why is this seal important for us to understand? What does this tell us about when that seal is opened, what is going to be taking place as far as false religion is concerned? What's it telling? What's it telling us? It's telling us this is not just going to be the run of the mill false religion and false teaching and deception. This is going to be false religion on an intensified scale, which is going to greatly sway the world. It's going to be false religion that greatly impacts the whole world. And, uh, you know, as, it, as you look at that, that being that's coming on the horse with the bow and its similarity to Christ, uh, this, it seems to indicate that we're going to be looking at a false messiah. Not just false teaching, but a false messiah. And a lot of people are going to be taken in by this. That's why it's important for us to know something about the messiah. So when people tell us, you know, the messiah just showed up over in Kuala Lumpur, and uh, you know, uh, whole, what? I don't think so. They may say they're the Messiah, but that's not who it is. So this uh, false Messiah is uh, tied in with the man of sin in Revelation 13, and Revelation 17, and other places. So what is the common outcome of false religion. What is the most common of outcome of false religion? There is something that follows on the heels of false religion, and that is war. War is basically comes about as a result of false religion. The false religion, people believe it, are pushing it, and other people say, no, we don't buy that, and we're going to resist that. And there's, there's war as a result of it. It says in chapter 6, verse 3, when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth. And that people should kill one another 
and there was given to him a great sword. So war comes about as a result of religious influences. Now, should we be surprised by this? Just look at the world today. Is religion helping to foment war? Is that the case? So you might think of jihad. You might think of uh, ISIS. You might think of uh, the civil war in city, Syria. It's a war between Sunnis and Shia. These two branches of Islam are fighting one another. So war, and, and that's just war in that part of the world. False religion brings about war. All you have to do is go back to think about the fall of Rome. When Rome fell, there was chaos. Chaos. So who came to fill the gap? The great church came to fill that gap. And war was one of the byproducts of that religious belief. And war characterized that whole thousand years that the, this a great harlot was in power and dominated the world. It didn't bring peace to the world. It did not bring peace to the world, and it won't when it is instilled in the future. <clears throat> so what we're talking about, and, and as you go down through history, war has been a common to the world all down through history. But when the, the second seal is broken and uh, the second horse begins to ride roughshod shot over the earth, then we're going to have war in an intensified, at an intensified level. War like we've never seen it before. So the fourth seal mentioned that the amount of the earth covered with war is a quarter of the earth. As you go back, uh, go a little further on and look at the fourth seal, it talks about a quarter of the earth. The only war that has uh, covered a quarter of the earth was World War II. That's the only uh, war that we're familiar with that that level of warfare took, took place. And what it says that the earth is going to be in, a quarter of the earth is going to be impacted by war. Not the whole earth, but a quarter of the earth. And the next war, as I said, will uh, involve a quarter of the earth geographically. And I think that we have, uh, it's, and it's going to be much more intense and destructive as you think about uh, the weaponry. I mean, you're looking at much more sophisticated weaponry. We can kill people at a much faster rate than we did in World War II. So you can bring about a lot of death and destruction without much effort. 